called us to be. This old song came to my mind this morning. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and shame. Aren't you glad that his blood has cleansed you of your guilt and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that he has relieved us from our shame, our condemnation, our eternal destiny separated from him in hell is where we were that's the state we were in until we were born again, until we came to know Jesus as our Savior. Um, I'm just thankful for that. Well, this morning we pick up in chapter 3 of, of John, and that's what Jesus is going to talk about, being born again, being born of the Spirit. Um, and there was a man, begins at verse 1, named Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. Um, and he came to Jesus by night. Uh, the Pharisee was, of course, uh, a part of the priesthood. The Pharisees were kind of, if you look at the wing of Judaism, they were kind of the attorneys, if you will, uh, those that, that scrutinized the law. And he 
came to Jesus. Now we know the background of the Pharisees. They, they were more concerned about the letter of the law rather than the spirit of law. And as a means to try to guard against and impose uh, weighty restrictions on the people, they put other laws in place to surround the laws, particular the law of the Sabbath, uh, keeping the Sabbath the day holy, separated unto the Lord. And so they were they were legalist. They they took the law of God, and they added other restrictions to that in order to to the very minutest detail, try to keep others from violating the law. And Jesus condemned them because he said, you know, those things that you heap on others, you don't even keep yourselves. And so they were, in fact, legalists. Um, and now, let me describe real quick. We, we accuse people of being legalists, and, and a lot of times we accuse them of being legalists just for holding to the Word of God. But legalism, by its definition, is, is taking... A, a requirement of God or taking a principle of Scripture that one may not have certain convictions over. There, there are many things we are free to, but we have to make a decision by the Holy Spirit whether or not that's good for us or not. For instance, uh, when I was growing up, it was, it was shunned upon for, for dancing. Baptists didn't dance. And I'm not sure why that was a a law, if you will, that people placed on it, but certain people may not have had convictions about dancing. Maybe they felt dancing was okay. Now, the Word of God certainly doesn't restrict dancing, but the Baptist said you can't dance, or you can't have long hair, guys, or, or women, you have to wear dresses, whatever it is. Well, that's a personal conviction. It's like that Paul was talking about in Corinthians of not eating meat sacrificed to idols. And so where I have a personal conviction that, that I say, you know, this is not okay for me. Um, I, I, if I took that conviction and I imposed it on somebody else and said, well, it's not okay for me, so it's not okay for you, then that's legalism by definition. And so it's taking those things that, uh, that may be a personal conviction and, and imposing that on others. That's legalism, and the church is full of legalists. And so here Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. It's interesting that he came to him by night. A couple of takes on that. One, maybe he was, uh, maybe he didn't want to be seen talking with Jesus because Jesus has already started some ruckus among the Pharisees at this time, and perhaps he didn't want to be seen by his fellow Pharisees of coming to Jesus. The other possibility is maybe he wanted some extended conversation with Jesus, and the only way to get to him was to come to him at night when the crowds weren't around him. But nevertheless, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And he came to Jesus and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So it was recognized that, that Jesus, at a minimum, was a teacher that was come from God because the signs that he had done, the sign that we looked at yesterday of just turning the water into wine, changing the molecular structure of something. Only God can can circumvent natural law. And so he recognized that he had to be a man from God. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Jesus kind of turns the tables on him. Nicodemus comes to him and says, Hey, we recognize you're a teacher from God. And Jesus seems to go right for the juggler in this. To get down to the point, listen, the reason I've come, I've come is so that men might be born again. And he said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There's no other way to have the forgiveness of sin, regeneration, to be, uh, to be declared righteous, to be declared holy in God's sight, unless one is born again. You can't go to, the, you can't go to church for a millennia and expect to be saved. You can't do uh, all good and expect to be saved. The Bible says that our righteousness before God's are just like filthy rags. In other words, any right that we would ever try to do in God's eyes is like filthy rags. And so there's nothing man can do to save himself. And so Jesus is declaring, this is why I've come, so that man might have the possibility of being, well, the probability of being born again if they place their trust in what I have done for them. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
Nicodemus didn't quite understand what Jesus was talking about. Nicodemus thought that Jesus was talking about things in the natural, in the flesh. Jesus was speaking of those things that are spiritually. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's the natural birth, born of water, and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, in our fallen sinful state, our spirits are dead to God. The moment Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden, their spirit was dead to God. It's dead, has no life in it. And unless that is born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, where a new creation is created, Paul said, we are therefore we're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have now become new. So unless one is born again, uh, born of the Spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. This body is going to die. It's going to waste away, or it's going to be cremated. It's going to go away. But our spirit remains forever. It lives forever. We might say we're really spiritual beings cloaked, in human flesh. And so where we commune, where we have a relationship to God is by our spirit. And so he goes on to verse seven to say, do not marvel that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now hear what Jesus is declaring, the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit of God. God works by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit, should I say, works to regenerate men, to, to cause us to be born again. And it's the Spirit's work that causes us to be born again. We cannot do it in our natural state. We can't do it just through a mental consciousness, but it's got to be by the Holy Spirit of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? You see, the Pharisees were the experts in the law. They were the experts in the word of God, in the, in the Torah, the Old Testament. And Jesus said, hey, you're an expert in the law, and you didn't see this all the time. You see, this isn't something new. This has always been. And he says, you didn't see this, Nicodemus? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Notice the plural pronouns in here, we and our. Speaking of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus was declaring was what God the Father and the Holy Spirit declares as well. Had always borne witness to this from the very beginnings of creation. And he, he says, we speak of what we know. And then in verse 12, again, that's another pointing to the deity of Christ. Um, verse 12 if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And then he goes on to say, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You see, when, when Moses lifted up that rod with the serpent on it, the gold and the bronze rod. Um, it was a foretelling of the son who would have to be lifted up on the cross as well. And he would have to die and he would have to be buried and he'd have to be raised again in order for spiritual healing to take place. You remember that account in the wilderness was when they had been bitten by vipers and Moses would hold that rod and that serpent up and the people would be healed by that foreshadowing of the healing from our sin wrought condition only can come through Jesus. That's why Isaiah said, by his stripes we are healed. Now, we can make application of that in a physical healing, but as Isaiah wrote that, he was speaking of our spiritual healing, the greatest healing that can ever take place 
is a healing from the disease that is the greatest disease that mankind has ever known, and that is the disease of sin. And it only comes through the shed blood of Jesus. Thank him this morning that you have been born again, that the Holy Spirit worked in you and drew you to have faith and trust in what Christ has done for you by shedding his blood, and that the Holy Spirit of God regenerated you, that which we could not do on our own. Not only did he do the work in regeneration, regenerating us, causing us to be born again, but it's by his blood that it keeps us in that eternal relationship with God through Jesus. I'm so thankful for that today. Good night. If you're watching this morning and 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 maybe you've just been a church person all your life and, and you know in your heart right now, you know, I know I've never been born again. I want to ask you to private message me. Send me a message and we'll have a further conversation about this because my greatest desire is that you would be born again and have the hope of eternal life. God forbid that we have a church full of church folk, but we want a church full of folks that have been born again, truly by the Spirit of God, and are able to worship Him because this life is not all there is. There's an eternal life, and either that life is going to be spent in eternity in continual, everlasting communion with God, or that eternal life will be separated from God in a place that is described and is called hell in scripture, eternal separation from God. There's only one thing in the balance that keeps us from going one, or will, will cause us to go one direction or the other, and that is by placing our trust and our faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us. Well, I pray the Lord blesses you today. I pray that you have opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel. Share with somebody today, if you have opportunity, the story, your story, how Jesus saved you. And if you recognize that somebody has had uh, has had a seed planted, that God would, would give you wisdom and the words to say, that you might help cultivate that seed of the word that's been planted in their heart, or by God's grace and his mercy, we'd be able to witness him save somebody today. I want to ask you to pray for me and Harold Danforth and Pastor Adrian. We will be leaving next Monday uh, to go to Nicaragua. Um, I believe I'll, I'll certainly be on the devotional on Monday morning. Uh, but I'm not sure about the rest of the week. It depends on whether or not we have internet service where we are. And so I may or may not be on next week. Um, but next Monday morning, I will be. We'll pick up in John chapter 3, uh, chapter three verse 16 in our devotions. But pray for us. Pray for our safety. Uh, pray for those men that will be encouraging Nicaragua's uh, uh, in a very tenuous state right now. And I, I think I saw Abit or Aaron on with me this morning that are there in Nicaragua. But pray for us as we travel. We'll be there from Monday to Friday of next week. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you that he keep you. Look forward to seeing you this weekend. Men, I'll see you Saturday morning. Have a great day.